What's good people, it's Enemy here, and today we are ranking every single banner that came out this year starting from the beginning to end of Book 7. We can look at a whole year of power creep and see just how well some of the units have aged, which units were irrelevant, and figure out which was the best banner this year that was truly worth your precious, precious orbs. We're looking at the most meta impactful banners and which units and skills would still give you value against the meta today, as of the end of Book 7. I'm only really mentioning the duo, rearmed, or attuned units of each banner, because they're usually the ones that have the potential to impact the meta the most. Though, you'll see me bring up several special exemptions pretty often, as we have a surprisingly high amount of units that impacted the meta more than the duo or rearmed units on the exact same banner. We're not looking for anything that has fallen out of the meta today, or something you wouldn't really use even on release. Speaking of something you wouldn't really use even on release, we have Guinevere, or what I like to call her, Null C Disrupt Fawn. Her kit is so unimpactful, she's not a good support, she's not a good nuke, and she's not a good water legend. Even intelligent systems knew we wouldn't want her, and so they put her on the historical worst selling banner of the year at the end of June, so she can join legendary Xander as one of the least impactful and worst selling legendaries in the game. Next up, we have Nerthus. She introduced Alarm, which is a small step in improving melee calves, one of the worst archetypes in the game right now. But melee calves are still in a weird spot in the meta, and if you just want the Alarm skill, you're better off waiting until the skill is on a unit that isn't on a legendary or mythic banner, because your odds are going to be way better. As a light mythic, she's got the playstyle of Freya, and that's definitely not what you want your mythics to be doing. Nobody in the meta would notice if either of these guys went missing. So I'm ranking them both in the bottom as some of the worst banners in the game. This time we have the legendary Yuri banner, who I wish I could put in S tier because Yuri is my favorite, but objectively speaking, he plays like a ranged hit and run unit in a day and age where nukes have gotten so insane that you can run someone else with better damage output and even better Kanto, because Kanto 2 just wasn't good enough. He came with Hexplate, which is a pretty good skill, but now you can get the Hexplate status from Plumeria, Yago, and so as the status becomes more and more common, and as they release better A skills like Prime, you might want to run something else in your A skill, or run someone else as your hit and run unit. Then we have the Valentine's Banner. There was a brief time in 2023 where intelligence systems wanted to buff healers, so they gave them new things, but then they made a 3 cooldown special that only Elise can use since she comes with slang. And since there's no arcane staff, you'd much rather run the 2 cooldown healing special that Alencia came with anyway for your favorite healers. I haven't seen Elise since she came out, or really anyone on this banner, which is crazy how we went from dual Chrom to this. I'm putting both the Goto for Mortis banner and the Young banner together down here for similar reasons. Both for Mortis and Young Hector were great at the time of their release, but they were probably too great for their own good. For Mortis winning a Hero Rises and everyone getting a free copy of him is probably why nukes are designed to be so crazy right now, and For Mortis is having some trouble keeping up his survivability. Armored Beacon was good at the time of release, and still is great now, but the best far saves at the end of Book 7 ended up being Dragon units because of Scout, and they're running Armored Flow, not Beacon. Dual Mark is really just a Summoner Duels unit that nobody even uses because he sucks, and Goto is actually pretty cool with his AoE reduction support, but otherwise, both of these banners have clearly shown their age. Last but not least, I'm putting both Engage banners down here. Both of these banners are just okay fodder with units that are niche at best or outright outclassed or irrelevant. Female Alir was an amazing godsword when she came out in January, but that was before they pumped out 10 more right after. Her charge support was unique at the time, but now you can get charge from Hinoka, Plumeria, and really, Alir is just nothing but fodder, and in fact, these skills are becoming more and more common. Alfred is probably the worst rearmed unit other than Lyft, and Saline is a green infantry mage that supports, and I can think of at least two more green infantry mages that I'd rather run for support instead. On the Brodia banner, Citrine is weirdly the best aged unit out of everyone else here, though I'd personally rather a unit that supports the team with even more effects, rather than spreading out the effects that are already on the team. Flash Sparrow is great, but nothing meta breaking, and even with these new skills, beast units still suck. This time, we have one of the dumbest banners ever made, the Ascended Fur and Haether banner. They really thought it was okay to put out yet another god sword, and it's weird that Fur came out and was worse than the ones that came out right before her. This banner is known for magic and physical null follow-up, which allows infantries to pierce damage reduction, but now that they've made Temple 4, you'd actually much rather run that and get NFU from somewhere else. 
Aether is actually pretty great. If I were looking at her alone, I would probably put this banner higher. But for how dumb it was to release Ascended Fur out of all people like this, I'm putting this banner right here. All of these banners were good, or even pretty great on release, but they're hardly worth summoning on them now, unless they're your favorites. I have to put them all in the top half of C tier. Next up, we have these three banners, which I call really good skill, but everyone else is just decent. Firestorm Dance 3 is the best skill for every dancer, and you can only get it from the Easter banner. And the desperation effect changes so many matchups into winning ones, which makes it easier to nuke in this age of player phase nukes. Rash Assault 4 is amazing damage reflection for anyone who can inherit it, and Speed Def Tempo 4 is now the best B skill for any ranged infantry physical nuke. These skills are amazing, but they don't open up any new shifts in the meta the same way something like Guidance 4 did. And the stars of the banner are good, but they're either outclassed in their respective roles already, they will be easily outclassed soon, or they're the best in niches that aren't really relevant, like Shamir the Godsword Killer, Karla as the best melee cow, or Nino the ranged nuke. The Arcane Dagger OC who I call a guinea is irrelevant. I would know, I have her. And lastly for this tier, I'm grouping both the Winter Banner and the Cadian Desert Banner together because they're both notable for being the only way to execute certain strategies. Winter Cordelia was a unique way to pull off Brave Effects with her Dual Strike effect, and unless you want to wait multiple turns with Aether, then this Cordelia is the only way you're going to get it off. Nobody would call giving your allies Brave a bad effect, but being adjacent turned out to be weirdly more restrictive than Triangle Attack, and there's a reason why you still see Bridal Catria today, and not everyone running around with Winter Cordelias, who was even sparkable. On the other hand, Desert Lind is basically a required unit for every Cav type strategy in Summoner Duels, with her ability to give null follow up and support through difficult terrain. With things like Incite and Alarm, Cavs are actually getting better, not worse. And ultimately, these two enable strategies that weren't the best in the current meta, but they're certainly better than everything that came before them on this list, and I wouldn't be surprised to see Cav lines rise up in the future. Overall, all of these banners are definitely useful and still pretty good today, but they've shown their age a little bit and it's getting harder and harder to justify the orbs for them. So these guys are going in the bottom of B tier. Then we have Inheritable Scowl and Guard Bearing 4. If your Dragon Far Save wasn't Bride Tiki or Brave Corrin, then this A skill was basically a must have at the time. And then, to this day, Guard Bearing 4 has made flyers even better than what they already are. Even right now, if you have a melee flyer, then you definitely want Guard Bearing 4 and you will be wanting guard bearing for for a very, very long time. That alone puts this banner right here. Next, we have the Holy Trifecta of Fallen Maria, Bridal Tiki, and Special Spiral 4. All of which these things were at the peak of the meta and arguably shaped it, but now they're becoming less valuable over time. Special Spiral 4 was a must-have skill for most of the year, but DR piercing is becoming more and more common, and it seems like that's the direction the game is going. While this used to be a must-have skill for basically every unit who could get it, it's now at the point where it's mostly armors who would want to run this, when infantries can now run things like the tier 4 null follow-up skills, or most preferably, tempo 4. Meanwhile, at the end of Book 7, Raitiki was definitely the best far save, but she wasn't that far off from Brave Korin, who everyone can get for free. And so the return on investment on your new far save unit is getting smaller and smaller as they keep making newer ones. Last but not least, we have Fallen Maria, whose Drive Miracle effect is still kinda useful, but she's slowly getting pushed more and more out of the meta as IS keeps finding ways to negate it with things like Fatal Smoke 4. She was definitely meta impactful at her peak, but to be honest, I only see her getting worse and worse as Anti-Miracle becomes more relevant or as player phase nukes get stronger and the Miracle effect isn't enough to save her ally. Honorable mention goes to Fallen Byleth for being the best godsword for a while until Speed Creep caught up with her, and to Saether for being a very good Astro Mythic, but I don't think she's the best Mythic probably because she's too busy giving birth. Next, we have the Legendary Shez and the Ascended Alincia banner, otherwise known as the Lucia banner. Both of these banners have a very strong player phase unit, and despite Ascended Alincia being the star of her banner, I would argue Lucia actually made a bigger impact on the meta because she ignores most of the game. Elincia introduced the best special for your favorite healers, but healers are still irrelevant in the meta unless you're Maria, and there's a reason why you don't see anyone using Ascended Elincia. Meanwhile, Lucia was definitely the best god sword at the time, and Gambit has only made her better, but being an infantry sword is the hardest unit type to be in Fae, and it's only a matter of time before they make a better one. And then for Legendary Shez, she's actually only gotten better with age and skills like Tempo 4, and I can honestly see her rising in value. Both of them are ranked down here mainly because of the downsides of being an infantry unit, which I can't believe I'm saying, and it goes to show just how crazy Power Creep has gotten this year. All of these banners either made an impact or was straight up the peak of the meta, 
but the power creep here feels like baby steps compared to the power creep they pumped out in other banners. So all of these banners are going into the top of B tier. Next up, we have both of these banners for bringing in the three best dancers in the game. It's kind of weird that they tried to sell us two green infantry AoE mage nukers back to back, but we're really just interested in the fairies. Pumeria and Peony give insane support, which is only aged better over time, as more and more units are running prime, while Triandra's debuffing and out of combat damage is so good when it stacks with the flared or strike skills. Not to mention, all three of them are flyers that can all run Soaring Guidance, Guidance 4, or even the new dance skills like Firestorm or Rockslide Dance. This is an age where the flyers and dancers have never been better. Here we have three mythics that you can be very, very happy about if you happen to get them. Gullveig is the best Gale Forcer in the game, while Kvasir's ability to dance other units is incredibly useful. Even if you never play Aether Raids, both Kvasir and Gullveig have the best possible skills any ranged cavalry unit could want. Meanwhile, Veil comes with the best B skill any mage infantry could want, while also giving resonance blades and shields as support effects, which is perfect for enabling prime users. And that's not even mentioning Veil's drive scowl effect, which is crazy given how much of a special centered meta that we used to be in. Between the three, I like Veil the most, with Golveg and then Kvasir following right after. But to be honest, I'd be happy to receive any of these units. Next, we have the Brave Banner, one of the most talked about banners that we've gotten all year for good reason. I think that Brave Robin will age the best, with his Rally Spectrum support being one of the best support effects in the game. Meanwhile, Golveg is a great Gale Forcer, Soren's assigned decoy can completely change the way you team build, and Corrin is one of the best far safe units in the game while also supporting the team with her defensive terrain. And that's not even mentioning the fodder with Gambit being one of the best B skills you can run, and Flared Sparrow being the best A skill ever made. This was the banner that introduced terrain effects, and this is the banner that started the new age of Fae. It's obvious they were cooking the good stuff in the kitchen for these banners. You'd be happy having any of these units today, and all of these banners provide you some great value. Next, we have these four banners that introduced the most obnoxious nukes in the game with Halloween Anna, T Ira, Wind Tribe Kagero, Wind Tribe Claude, and Ninja Sanaki. Halloween Anna is so stupid, and I hate fighting her in Summoner Duels. Flyers are so good there, and she's no exception with her miracle and flying privileges. Ninja Sanaki will delete basically anyone she initiates on with her DR piercing, and T Ira and Wind Kagero are the best hit and run units in the game with a level of Kanto that is beyond stupid and it reminds me that Kanto is one of the worst things they put in this game. I know that putting the banner with Wind Tribe Claude this low is a war crime in several countries, but ever since Legendary Veronica, I've always thought the game has progressed to a point where if unit initiates, enemy unit disintegrates immediately. And so Wind Tribe Claude and player phase nukes like these units don't drastically reimagine the way we think about the game. And that's why I ranked these banners here. Shout out to T Sigurd for being a ranged version of his legendary self with a sweep effect and still not being that meta relevant. Power Creep has come so, so far from Book 5. Okay, I know putting legendary female Lear this low is such a big hot take, but bear with me. I think her support is insanely good, but the game is progressing to a point where damage reduction piercing keeps getting added to new units or is accessible to old units in different ways. I actually see her aging poorly from a support standpoint, kind of like legendary male Violet who was also incredible at the time, but has fallen off when NFU was given out like crazy. That being said, Legendary Alir is still an amazing support today and remains the best Omni tank in the game. Her offense is incredible and she's the best user of the distant counter dragon seal. She doesn't even need Bride Catria support because she can do brave attacks on her own and she's probably the best infantry melee delete button. Meanwhile, Dual Asker's support has actually only gotten better with the introduction of Prime, and he remains the best way to provide cooldown support with your allies while also being a great unit himself. There's a reason why he was the best Summoner Duels unit for a long time, and even to this day, he still benefits your team. Both of these units are already crazy good offensively and defensively, but being able to do all that while also offering insane support is what makes both of these units insane. 
Last but not least, we have Guidance 4 and Soaring Guidance. The rearmed banner is here because she introduced the skill, though it's crazy to think that we're at a point where we would prefer Soaring Guidance over Guidance 4 when flyers are so good. Meanwhile, the July Summer banner was one of the best banners in the game for two big reasons. Soaring Guidance and Summer Ymir. And her being on the same banner to introduce Soaring Guidance is insane. If you don't have Guidance 4 or Soaring Guidance, then you truly don't understand just how broken it is. A ranged unit can attack an enemy 6 tiles away in a game where the maps are 8 tiles tall. This one skill has fundamentally changed the way we think about the game because movement, the single most important aspect in all of Fire Emblem, has never been better. I have no idea what they were cooking, but if my opponent has Soaring Guidance, which they probably do, then I'm not hungry anymore. These units and skills make it so you simply cannot recognize the game anymore with the amount of power creep and how different the game looks now. All of these units are easily candidates for a Hero Rises and are truly some of the best units or skills in the game. All of these banners are at the top of A tier. And with that, we've just covered some of the best units in the game. In fact, these units and skills are so good that any amount of normal people would call this a reasonable amount of power creep. Unfortunately, the folks at Intelligent Systems are not normal people. These last four banners are so insanely stupid, it will make you question if any of the devs even play this game at all. In the bottom of S tier, we have Freya, aka your mandatory unit on every Anima team. Astra and Anima are defined in his name. He is a culmination of stupid game design and power creep in Fire Emblem Heroes. For something as stupid as Elamine in Astra Season, it only made sense for them to introduce something even more stupid. We have reached a point where even the timing of when your skills go off is getting power crept. Because now, Freyr is running things even earlier at the start of player phase or enemy phase, not at the start of turn. He shuts off false start and any other penalties because why not while he's already there. He's incredibly bulky and he also grants resonance shields because why not? That's so nice of you Freyr. Oh, you shouldn't have. No, really, Freyr, you shouldn't have. I don't even know what they could do to neutralize his penalty neutralization unless they make a skill called Phantom Freyr, where at start of match, if Freyr is on the enemy team, treats units Freyr as if he was legendary Ike. Otherwise, out of everyone in Book 7, Freyr might actually age the best. But because he's only relevant in anima season, that's why he's number 4. But quite frankly, it's for the best that they locked this monster to his one season. In number 3, we have Legendary Male Robin. It's insane to think that everyone underestimated him on release, because in this age of effects and supports, he only gave stats and unity. But Robin fundamentally changed the way we think about penalty neutralization, out of combat stats, and the importance of stats as a whole. His effect is so good, because it takes something that is normally bad, penalties on your units, into the most insanely broken level of in-combat stats you've ever seen. And the worst part is that, for the longest time, there was nothing you could do about it. You can't turn off the penalties of your opponent. Like, it wouldn't even make sense to do that. I can prevent you from getting buffed, but how would I prevent you from getting debuffed? And so Grand Strategy is such poor game design that even intelligent systems didn't know how to counter it. They tried to with Sabotage, which inflicts in-combat stat debuffs, but even that wasn't enough, so they had to do the most unimaginative thing possible to nerf Legendary Robin, which was introducing the Ploy skill, which says, if opponent has Grand Strategy, no they don't. I know it's crazy to put him as low as number 3, but it's mostly due to the fact that IS is actively trying to push him out of the meta, so it's hard to say how well he'll end up aging. Both Sabotage and Ploy are becoming more and more common, and they're basically slapping Ploy on every 5 star that can run it. But, even if you're running Ploy, you still need to hit a res check and have your enemies be in a certain range, so it might not even go off anyways. Legendary Robin defined basically every mode. He can inflate all of your stats to insanely high levels you've never seen before. In the age of support effects, Legendary Male Robin was the best, and everyone else has to waste space in their skill economy just to play catch up against this monster threat himself. In second place, we have Legendary Hinoka. I have nightmares thinking about every Legendary Hinoka paired up with any flyer. Because of Soaring Guidance, you can warp in a 3 move ranged unit with the best mobility in the game, special cooldown plus 1 per attack so she can get her dead eyes off, she'll debuff you because why not, she has true damage, effective against flying and armored units, and in case you somehow survive, if you lose a speed check, you also can't counterattack. We are in the flyer age because of Hinoka herself. She created flyer lines and she's relevant in every single mode. Flyers have never been better because of her. 
she doesn't need to support her allies with Guidance 4, which she can give her and her flying allies Charge instead. Giving Charge alone would make her more broken than every Legendary Roy combined. But she also gives special cooldown plus one per attack to her allies, because why not? And she also debuffs every infantry, armored, or cavalry unit, because why not? Are you kidding me? She did not need to do that. This must be some sick joke from the developers. If you have a Hinoka, you will be happy for a very, very long time. The only reason why Hinoka's number two is because it seems like IS wants to improve cavalry units with things like Alarm, Insight, Flared Sparrow, and Mirror, and the Strike skills. So I wouldn't be surprised if we wanted to start running calves in the potential future instead of Legendary Hinoka support. But despite that, I can easily see the arguments for putting Legendary Hinoka as the best banner of the year, when she is easily one of the best units in the game and definitely the best flyer we've ever gotten. Actually, I can think of only one flyer that might be better than Legendary Hinoka. A unit so ridiculous, who's better than Freyr, better than Robin, and better than Hinoka. I present to you the most insane, monstrous unit ever produced in all of Book 7. We have Legendary Alincia. Take everything I said about Guidance 4 and Soaring Guidance and then multiply it by a million. Guidance 4 and Soaring Guidance can make your allies warp like crazy, but you have to pick between warping your armors or your flyers. Meanwhile, Alincia just doesn't discriminate, unlike the people in her games. Infantries, flyers, armors, calves, she can warp them all. And giving them not just half, but full no follow-up is the icing on the cake. She doesn't care about Catchery support, which she comes with the best effect in the game, Unconditional Brave on both player phase and enemy phase. And she also comes with Flat Canto 2, because why not? And in the age where flyers have never been better, she is a flyer. The craziest part is that she didn't need to give her allies null follow-up. She would still be this broken with the warping alone, because by the end of Book 7, unless you're running just Gatekeeper, not Mer because Mer sucks, then you have absolutely no way to combat the insane level of movement Alincia provides. Just like Legendary Male Robin, everyone is stuck playing catch-up, wasting skill economy or actions to actively combat her warping, something that she does passively just by sitting there. And even if warping becomes less relevant, she's still an unconditional brave attacker that can fly and run Flared Sparrow. I have no idea what they were cooking. She combines everything that makes Guidance 4 and Soaring Guidance so broken with her support while also being the best flyer in the entire game. She's definitely my pick for the best unit to come out of Book 7. It should be no surprise that Legendary Alincia and the rest of these war crime activists are going into S tier. All four of these units fundamentally changed the way we think about the game. They most definitely broke the meta, and it makes me question if Intelligent Systems even knows how to design their own game. I cannot believe that Alincia and all of these monsters came from the same people that made Legendary Guinevere. And you know, if we take a look at the Sensor Tower performance rankings, which ranks the best and worst selling banners of the year, it's crazy to think that four of the worst selling banners of the entire year were actually the launch banners of four of the most meta-breaking units in the entire game. What surprises me the most in particular is that Legendary Alincia's release banner had Alincia, Hinoka, and Rearmed Krom all color sharing. So you have two of the most broken characters in the entire game along with the best arcane sword and a rearmed unit perfect for skill duplication. But despite that, Legendary Alincia's release banner was still one of the worst selling banners in the mall. And in this sense, this was the best banner of Book 7 that everyone clearly missed. But come on now. We all know this game shouldn't be played for the meta. Power creep is temporary, but your favorites are forever. Whether you want to summon for the art, or the skills, or for Legendary Guinevere, the only units worth summoning for in this game are always going to be the ones that bring you the most joy. And so the actual best banner in all of Book 7 is the one with your favorites. So there you have it. What do you think? I have a couple of hot takes in this one, so I'd love to hear what you agreed or disagree with. Let me know in the comments below. Feel free to comment and give this video a like only if you liked it. It would mean so much to me. You watching, liking, and commenting really does make a difference. I've got plans to make tons more Fire Emblem Heroes content just like this one, so subscribe if you're interested. I appreciate you for watching, and I'll see you again real soon.